College of Rheumatology ACR 2021 Convergence, their annual scientific uh, convention that they have had for many years since the 1930s. And we have been attending for roughly a decade um, every year. And as you know, most things are virtual. So here we are. Um, different, different backgrounds. I'm simulating what it would be like if I was reporting live from an actual um, convention. So we are the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. My name is Tiffany Westrich Robertson. I'm the CEO of the organization, and I'm also a person living with the diseases, uh, predominantly axial spondyloarthritis. And I'm going to turn it over and we'll go to Katie because the last two days, I think yep. I went to Deb next. So let's change it up. Let's go to Katie to say hello. Okay then. Well, hello. Um, I'm Katie Simons. I am the Senior Program and Communications Manager at AR Arthritis. Also a person living with an AR Arthritis disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or JRA for about 20 years now. Um, and currently I'm in Metro Detroit, but, you know, zooming into the conference, which is delightful. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it over to Deb. Hey, everybody. I am Deb Constein. I am tuning in from um, the Sun Prairie, Madison, Wisconsin area. And um, I am also a person living with these diseases. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I was diagnosed roughly around the age of 13. So 38 years of having this um, wonderful disease. Right. It's been, yeah, it's, that's a learning curve. I'll say that, but again, it's been, it's been <laughs> awesome. And I'm, it's a pleasure being here with, um, you know, AI arthritis being here and just going to the conferences and digging in and, you know, just disseminating back to all of you. That's um, right. That's what we're doing. doing. We are, we are tending the sessions that are relevant to advance our mission which is to help other people living with our diseases to have a voice alongside other stakeholders as equal. So all these people back here behind me, doctors, researchers, nurses, all of them right there, equal, equal people at the table. That's not really a table, but you know, <laughs> if I turned around and be like one of them. And so what we try to do is make sure that we are, we are counted as equal so that together we can solve problems. So we're looking for those missing links. We're looking for those aha moments, those things we can tackle observed by people living with diseases. And then we talk to the other stakeholders and we say, hey, how together can we solve these problems? And we always focus on education, which also is, is, is um, awareness and then advocacy, which is public policy and research. So as you can see, research, we're right here. So um, we do a program, we started it two years ago called Go With Us to Conferences. And this is the fourth time now that we have done this program. And um, so it's like the end of the pilot and our Go With Us peeps aren't here right now, but that's okay. If you look in debrief one and two, they're there. Um, but you know, and it was over the weekend and now they had to go back and do some of their daily life opportunities. But we're gonna give a shout out to Effie and a shout out to Stephanie um, because they still did attend a couple of the sessions today and they'll be going with us continued throughout the week. And, and hopefully they're gonna be popping in again at, at some, some debriefs as well. But as our mission is to help other people, we always pick at least two others um, from our community living with our diseases to give them the experience as well to go to these conferences. And we are all about opportunity and connecting patients with those opportunities to have a voice. So day three, oh, I'm we're like, how many, we, just tomorrow. Yeah, just tomorrow, because Wednesday's sort of a, a half day, but we do have access to these sessions for a few months. So even though we might, the, the actual conference sort of ends tomorrow, we'll still be seeing some of these sessions and doing continued debriefs to make sure you get all the, the information. So today, we are going to talk about a session that we went into alternative therapies 
for the management of pain syndromes, which I, all of us across the board wanted to go to that yeah. one. And, and I know Effie was there too. So she just could she wasn't able to, to join us tonight. Then we're going to, I'm going to break out and talk about a session called preclinical RA, which is really about microbiome gut bacteria, oral, like bacteria you've heard about, about um, that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as it relates to prevention. Hmm. Yeah, that's, then, the first we've actually heard, <laughs> that's the first time we've heard that is prevention. Some of the, we did that's hear some, some prevent, which you're going to remember, Deb, because yes. they cited actually a couple of the abstracts that we heard about um, I think when we were talking about remission a couple of years ago, but it's a good example of how they bring things back, like research yeah. builds upon research. And it's like the really cool, the more you go to say, oh my gosh, we just went, yes. we went to that, you know, whatever. And you start to see it coming back. And that's where we are is, 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 is at that point. Then um, Deb and Katie are going to talk a little bit about a session on climate that I did not attend. Climate then, change, yep. And then I'm going to talk a little about a session for undifferentiated connective tissue disease, which is a major focus of our organization. Um, it's one of them that, that it, it's kind of that pre-diagnosis that some people never progress to a full-blown categorized disease and they stay at that level. Um, but others of us do. It's something that we have, fo we have focused on. We give those people a home because I was that person and many of us are that when you like a uh, question mark. Uh, so I'm going to dive into that. It was very, very interesting. I was, I'm going to make sure I reach out to those researchers because that was really, really interesting. And then last but not least, just a brief uh, overview of a couple COVID things because COVID is just there. Like every single set, like every day, it's like several different areas, but we are starting to realize that a lot of them are repeating. So we don't want to spend a lot of time giving you the content that we have had in some of our other sessions. So let's jump in. The first one, alternative therapies. Who wants to who wants to lead off? You know, oh, I can't. Wait, kind of... I forgot. Wait for it. I forgot about my wait for it. Oh, here we come. Oh, wine today. Yes. I had I had pie yesterday. I had I had wine today before. What that is, is we at our organization, we try to simulate really being a conferences. And we're not promoting alcohol in any way, shape, or this could be juice, this could be water, this could be coffee, uh, hot chocolate. <laughs> I think Katie was, was going to have um, a nice water. Cup of there we go. And yeah. what happens is when you're done with a day at the ACR, the next step is usually an organized social hour. So the, the conference itself may have a big banquet hall, sort of like this size with with food and with wine and, and beer and, and different soft drinks, et cetera, and people network and get together. Or we tend to run home, freshen up, change, and then we might have anywhere from one to three different socials to go to at the evening. And while we're in the cab or in the Uber on the way over, we're debriefing. And then maybe while we're at a table eating dinner, we're talking about what we saw today. So that's why you see this because it's real. We are real. We are bringing the real experience to you. And this is what we would be doing if we were really at ACR today. So sorry about that. Now, take it away. Awesome. Virtual reality. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. yes. Yeah, simulating that. So there were two different talks during, the, during this session. And the first one was um, very dedicated to CBD. And she talked very in depth about CBD in general. Um, um, oh my gosh, uh, mm. Canna Canna oil. oil. Yeah, which, I can't which say is that. Part of the plant. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we. I, I'm sure a lot of people, most people, do have heard CBD, but right. I just want to make sure. And there's two different versions of CBD. There's the THC, which is the kind that gets you high. And then the CBD is basically what doesn't get you high. It's just right. But the, it's the, it's the plant and there's correct. two, there, right. Okay. So, so there we go. Now go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, you know, she talked about all the different things and different studies. Um, what we were seeing is there's not a lot of research behind it. Um, as far as, 
you know, saying that it actually helps with pain. There isn't, and it's, I'm surprised even at this point, because it's been a hot topic for like, I would say the last three to five years, or is it even longer than that? Mm. Well, Deb, think, you know, I, I was thinking about it today. I don't know what year it was, but I know that we were at an ACR and they used Harry. to, have, when, they, when they used to have the sessions for this, yes. they were at like 6.30 at night once people yeah. had already so, left. Yeah, after everyone's we would gone stay. and left. Yes. And we would say, and we watched them and I, we'll have to go back and, and, and look. There were Correct. studies that, that were showing it and actually shout out to Bridget who is one of our very long-term volunteers and knows everything there is under the sun about this. She, she runs the um, Canapet, or Canapet, that's what my, that's what my dog uses. <laughs> the CBE <laughs> sorry, Bridget. The Canapatient Connection, she has a nonprofit and she, they are have a lot of resources and that she's done several talk shows on our AI Arthritis Voices 360 talk show on this. So we have downloadable materials that we can share um, but I know that there has been some research done, so I'm going there to circle has, back. Yeah, to there has been some, share. but it's still under, under research, I think at this point. Sure. Um, and she was talking about, again, topical, and she talked about topical CBD. She talked about transdermal COD, CBD. and trans Which is the topical? Well, it is, but what it is is like putting it on a patch. And again, it has to have a method to get through um, the skin to get into the deep um, muscle tissues and things like that. But um, I'm surprised even at this point, there isn't more research on just the transdermal and things like that. But anyways, I'm just kind of giving a brief synopsis mm -hmm. and then we'll dig in. Um, so she talked um, far and wide, but again, just showed studies that just really weren't confirming that it was very um, efficacious. Yeah, just uh, something that really worked for pain there pain management. So um, the second talk was very much about acupressure and acupuncture. And he talked in depth about that. And I think the biggest conversation that came out of his talk was how um, our insurance companies um, just aren't in the covering. US. Yes, in the US, yeah, the United States aren't covering. Um, again, in, I think the first um, person she was from Europe and again she was say, she definitely went into the variations of U.S. versus Europe and again U.S. is far behind where um I the think European they mentioned are. that um acupuncture I believe they mentioned Germany is starting to cover it through their insurance and I think there was another example but I don't quite remember so yeah. it's starting to change acupuncture has yeah, been I'm so hoping. researched that you know and people are finding it very useful in, you know, some of their um, alternative medicine treatments. But um, sadly, when it's coming out of pocket, when you're paying for medications, you, something's got to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just I'm, I'm looking at my notes on the acupuncture and it's like, it's funny because I, I like to highlight, it's why I'm looking over here and I yeah. like to highlight things while I'm in the session in a different color so I can quickly look at them. But then of course, one, one bullet that's not blue, uh, I just found, oh, I should have. And this, I found fascinating. I said fascinating instead of interesting. Did you catch that? Yes, you're good. So, you're changing. <laughs> trying to expand our terminology away from interesting. Um, but one of the things that he said is, is a reason why they feel acupuncture may be so highly successful is that there's a lot of studies that show brain activity happening during the acupuncture process. And it could be in part activating and stimulating the brain in the area, or they've seen it stimulating in the area that has the relaxing effect on the central nervous system. See, you know, how cool is that? Yeah. Uh, so that's just showing, I mean, that's, that's data. That's, that's showing you that it, it's, it's so, and, and I'm going to go back to uh, a year ago. I think it was, there was, I don't know if it was ACR, or if it was ULAR, but it was all about the brain body connection and how the brain you have, you have the different areas of the brain that perceives the pain and you're feel you're, it's here before it's here. Yep. And so that makes sense. That correlates. Oh, yeah. 
it does. And well, that was, again, that better. session, yeah, that session in itself was one that fascinated all three of us. And we kept talking about, you know, it's all in your head and it literally is because it's your brain. <laughs> yeah. We, we gotta, we gotta re revisit that, that session with yeah. the brain and body connection. Cause that was just, um, really, uh, nice together. Eye -opening. Yeah really eye-opening. And then the only other thing that, that I had mentioned for the acupuncture in particular was as they were talking about studying how it has different effects on pain in people and the brain activity, they did it again. They threw out precision medicine and I just went, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's it just <laughs> everywhere. And again, our organization recognized precision medicine being the answer back in 2015, when we started our, uh, we won an innovation and research award that, that initiated because we were trying to figure out ways that patients and industry researchers and pharma could communicate better to influence drug development. That's how it started. Right. But at the, we had a second outcome in that. And it was because we realized that more patients had to have a voice and, uh, and also that we're all unique and we're all individual and why are we not responding to the same treatment? So it was all sort of this hypothetical, um, thought process. And we realized through the focus groups that were patient led, by the way, I, I did go to, to college courses and, and was taught to be a professional focus group moderator and to run those. And what we realized through those were patients were saying across the board, pharma and non-pharma, pharma and non-pharma, there's no magic pill. It, it, it's one, it's not one size fits all. And that was really the moment that we said, it's got to be precision go. medicine. I mean, we, this right. has got to be the way that we go if we're going to um, match patients with the right treatment at the right time, but also long-term save money. And, and so we have been working towards that honestly, since 2015. And we have some projects that came, came up in 2017, 2018 um, about this. And, and we've been like screaming it from the rooftops. And here it, it's everywhere. Literally yeah. every yeah. session I feel it's like. Catching on. It, yeah. It's finally here. And we had so many people, even up to months ago, say, oh, it's so far out. It's so far out. You all are way, way getting, you've been getting into this way ahead. There, we're talking 10 years and I, I just want to go, oh. Yeah. Like, like a little years. bit like I told you so, <laughs> but kind of like I warned you so. Yeah. It was kind of yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know so we feel, we feel very cutting edge. Um, but anyway, yeah. other, other things about the acupuncture. Is there anything that, that we missed? I just, is the, is the highlights from that? Yeah, I Have either of you tried acupuncture? Because I can't imagine paying it's not money that I don't to do want that. To. I just my insure my health insurance wouldn't that would not cover that. I've actually like experimented with it. So I've been in like a conference and there's been somebody and she went around for volunteers that wanted. So I had like a needle in the top of my head, like up here. And um, where else did she? Oh. Um, tops of my shoulders. So again, she put like three of them in and, you know, I could feel a difference from just three little needles that were in me. And um, if anybody's asking, did it hurt? Not at all. They are, they are like hair, like mm -hmm. thinness. And it's like, she puts it and she taps it and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's as deep as it, it needs makes to go. Makes sense though, because think about how small like, nerves are, but they hurt. Yeah. Like if you've ever pinched a nerve, or people who have fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. or you, you know, it, it, it's just these little teeny teeny things. So if you know where to pinpoint, right, it, it makes sense. Is yeah. Is, is all I'm saying. He had a structure that was a human body, and it had all like all the points all over it, like where you I can could call them pathways. Yes, or something. It, that's exactly what they're called. Um, and there's hundreds of them all over our body. That was just the front version of what he was showing. And, you know, there's a whole mess on your back too and stuff. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. Again, just knowing other things 
And, um, you know, even like massage therapy, some massage therapy is being covered from some insurances these days in the United States. I'm speaking of, um, specifically, and, um, it's coming. I just, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've looked into that, but I will. Yeah. Cause again, um, again, you don't know what you don't know about your own insurance until you go That's looking. True. Yeah. True. So I think um, that was the bottom line on that one was just the and- coverage. And it kind of circles back to pain management, improving quality of life. And that, you know, it all gets back to, you know, we want a quality of life. So. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'm going to, I'm going to do the transition of of going back to the the CBD. And there are a lot of studies that do show that it induces alterations in brain activity. So while we're talking about the, the brain activity, that to me was, was a little eye opening. Um, because, and I do know that the side effects can occur with any dose of CBD, which they said, because Bridget, who I referenced earlier, did say the same, has said the same thing on our talk show. Um, but I guess as a person that's used CBD drops, it was so subtle. I never felt anything. I, I never, I never felt um, any sense of like, ment- like feeling, you know, like a medic, med- uh, medicinal uh, high or anything like that, but that doesn't mean it wasn't changing something in, okay. in my brain. I just didn't feel anything. So that, that was caught me off guard, but I think what really we all found the most fascinating was there was a Brazilian study in particular that they cited mm-hmm. and said that they showed people when they started CBD, that they, that they had increasing abnormal liver function tests. And then when they took them off, it went away. And so that trans that inspired me to submit a question, which was asked. Woo! It, answered, it's yeah, it was answered. And they, they read it and answered it. And basically I said, look, wait a minute. We're we're on all of these medications, particularly you think methotrexate, that's the one that came to my to my mind initially, and that we know are hard on the liver. And I know as a person living with these diseases, I didn't know that CBD could be hard on the liver. It never would have honestly occurred to me. And that is something I think almost every rheumatologist, every patient needs to be aware of when you're making that disease management treatment plan. If a person is on one of these drugs that, that can increase liver enzymes, I think the next question should be, are you using CBD? Right. Because, it, you know, that she brought up that thing of drug drug interactions. And that's where she got very specific to that, that there are some drug drugs. So again, CBD being a drug and methotrexate, for instance, being a drug, those drug drug interactions exist. And you need to look into those. And people and I don't were think, making comments. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people would realize that. No, that they I should mention never. CBD. They probably it's like, oh, it's it's safe. It's you know a supplement. Exactly. I don't have to worry about Natural, prescription you know, interaction. And, yeah, right. so and it's everywhere. When we talk about everywhere, yeah. it's everywhere. And that's actually funny. That's the name of one of the episodes we did with Bridget. Is CBD? It's everywhere. That was the name of it. But <laughs> um, but because you see it, you can't go. I mean, I know not recently, but I know a couple of years ago going to a, like a local festival and people they're selling CBD water and, you know, you go to the grocery store and it's, and we know that it's not all, you know, this, this higher grade medical grade type of thing. But the, the point is it's, you see it everywhere. So it normalizes it right to the point that you don't think about it interacting right I had not and that was again something new learned um definitely during that session for sure so that was I think all all I had other than there was one study that they they get a lot and, that, and again I, I've said this in some of the other debriefs you've been here with us but essentially when you go to these sessions it's not like you go to a, a conference or, and they're they're presenting like you have a speaker and they're presenting research. It's a research yeah. convention. So all of the sessions are based most of the, all of, most of the sessions. Some of them have like co- conversational components, but most of them they're presenting research, and the discussion is based on that research. Mm-hmm. So in this in particular, 
there was a study that they were using CBD for clinical pain using the transdermal. So that's what you were, you were yeah. mentioning um, earlier, Deb. Right. And uh, it said that there was, it, it was for osteo. We don't cover osteoarthritis, the degenerative at our organization, but regardless, it was, it was for osteo and psoriatic arthritis, which we do. And it was compared to a placebo, which means not, it was something that did not contain the CBD. And there was no st statistically significant effects regarding sleep quality, depression, anxiety, or pain. That surprised me. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I didn't, agree. I, it, it just, it did. It really surprised me. And I, I would like to ask Bridget to weigh in. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of put a plug in that for my, for my comments, yeah. if you all want to, want to add to it and just say, is that more specific to transdermal? Because they didn't pull up any like, oh, if you do the drops or you do, there's so many ways yeah. that you, you can use CBD. So I just want to clarify that was a study using the transdermal method. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anything else that we wanted before we move on to the next topic? No, I think we covered it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I keep muting myself, but I've got the windows open and there's some angry teens outside. So I'm going to mute myself as I talk. So when I'm not talking, because, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. No problem. Um, I am not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. This is more of just reporting back a little bit of information from one that we went or I went to and Effie shout out was also there but like I said earlier she wasn't able to join us today. So this is uh the session was called preclinical rheumatoid arthritis can we stop RA? Wow, I want to go to that. Which I have to preface it's funny we realized that they're really they're really doing a good job of of jazzing up the the titles to suck us in. And then we get there and it's about um the microbiome and <laughs> having a bacteria. I and, dug into it and I was and, like, and, yeah. you know, fecal matter and, and also in, in the salivary glands and, and, I get samples. and, and yeah, so, so it, it was just, it's, it's just a good example of like, wow. And you're like, oh, poop. <laughs> What did, what did, what did Effie say? She said something like, um, and again, shout out to Effie. Um, she's like, we got catfished in by the words they yeah. were using. <laughs> but no, it was, but, but the information was really good. And, and, and one of the things that they're, they're talking about in this in particular, because, because gut micro, um, the, 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 the bacteria, that, this is not new. We have, we've heard of all of this for, for being triggers to rheumatoid arthritis for quite a while. Um, but what they started talking about was how they can use it to predict RA from happening. And I have to go back in our debriefs from a couple of years ago, because I really can't remember when. I did one was. that was very into the whole poop and all that. And it was a gentleman. I, I, I did that one again, being a dietitian, that was kind of what the microbiomic, I got into it and I yeah. like disseminated it and it. This one seemed very much like it. Yeah. It so there, there have been several and there were a couple that we saw, I want to say a year or two ago that was talking about trying to use treatments to stop rheumatoid arthritis from ever starting. So if you had certain biomarkers like rheumatoid factor positive, um, ANA, uh, or no, ANCA positive, like there were certain biomarkers that we know are, are strongly associated with RA family history, those kind of things. And we did see some studies presented previously that they cited, they mentioned them today. And it was um, saying that while it did not prevent these people from getting it, it delayed. So by starting the treatment earlier, it delayed. So who knows what will happen from that as we move forward, you follow these people longer, do they ever get aggressive disease? And the, that's a very Good question, because we do know that people who have those biomarkers tend to have more aggressive disease. So it'll be really good to see as we move forward if these, you know, long, you know, if these people are followed, if they were almost pre-treated, if you will, with a disease-modifying agent, will they develop a serious RA? So prevent 
or is it prevent all the way? Is it keep it at bay so it does not become severe? So that's still a, a question that, and I that think we have to go They with. were using um, the metaphor of a candle flame and then like a bonfire and then like a forest fire. Like forest fire is full blown RA, but if we can see that candle, can we blow that out? Yes. So I thought that was a good metaphor as far as stopping it before it started and the, the difference between an itty bitty little candle and like a huge forest fire. He called it the stairway to RA. Yes. And I think he also mentioned a few times uh, the, the slogan, I guess, intent to prevent. So, oh, yes. Interesting. Yeah, he said prediction, two part question. Where am I on the staircase? And if so, if I'm on it, what step am I on? <laughs> I thought that's that's good. That's a good analysis. Um, really so basically, good. will I get RA and when? Yeah. And and, um, and so it was. It, it had a lot of good information as far mm -hmm. as the fact that they're testing this. So that's I think the message we want we want to bring across. We're not going to try to relay all of the, the science and the specific studies to you. It is a person living with the diseases. The thing to know are these studies are happening and they are starting to at least unravel that there are some ways to predict at least these uh, microbial signatures. And that's the word signatures keeps coming up again too. Oh, yeah. I know that that has been a researcher term for a long time but now with the whole precision medicine we keep it just got a different adjective in front of it yep. <laughs> but we keep I keep seeing fill in the blank signature fill it you know and and so it just again has that precision medicine sort of flair or or feel to it oh it even says I'm literally looking at it in my notes if they were, if the certain biomarkers were higher than these, that are in, in some of the new signatures that they're finding with the in the microbial structures, those could eventually add to these other biomarkers we already know and become future biomarkers. So there you go. Biomarkers is ta -da. medicine. So da da da. <laughs> Interesting. Put, yeah. Put, put that together. Um, so uh, let's see. Katie, what, what, did you take, uh, did you go to this one? The preclinical RA? Oh yeah, you did. You did yeah. because you, you, yeah. Okay. The, the, the other one. So what else do you want to add to this? Um, that it, it was very hopeful that, you know, in the future generations won't have to go through what we did. Um, and then I know it gives people resources, especially like family members who might, you know, know that it runs in your family, you know, can I do anything proactively? Um, and I know he emphasized educating patients um, and educating them on what tests they can take and the test results, hmm. what they mean. And if there and are any changes. Too. And they well, said both. Absolutely. Making sure doctors know what they could test for too. And knowing when those changes happen, what changes happen to get in right away for treatment. So, okay. and even earlier treatment and earlier diagnosis. So all very hopeful. So that's, yes. I love it. I have, I, I'm going to pull up three other points that, that I have highlighted here in my notes. The first one is we're talking about pre-treatment. And so one of the things as a patient, think about this. So you get diagnosed with something and then it's, I have to find a treatment and even getting access to that treatment sometimes is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Because your insurance or your health agency or your government or whomever is mandating your access to treatments is doing some level of deciding when and, and how you, you get that. And so here we're trying to target before a diagnosis happens. So there's a question mark that's in trials right now. What yeah. happens when it hits the real world? So they did pose that question. You're going to hit a wall at some point. So can we even get that type of of addressing and preventing treating before it actually is diagnosed. Is that even able to happen, number one? And number two, what is the ethical implication? So these, these treatments have high potency. And so knowing that they talked about really having doctors and patients have to do that benefits risks, discussion, shared decision-making, mm -hmm. something we, we keep bringing up where you're talking to your doctor, you're communicating because 
you would need to really not be able to discuss, do I want to be on a more aggressive therapy in the hopes of either preventing or potentially uh, um, ensuring that my disease does not progress Any to, further. to a level. Right. You know, so, right. so communication is going to be really important. They also um, did say it to clarify, there is no um, robust data. There's no uh in-depth research that suggests that diet or exercise can prevent RA. Um, uh, so, but we do know from past from past conferences that smoking has there is data that shows, particularly smoking with the ANCA and positive ANCA and positive RA factor do equate worse disease. That is that is shown many many times. Um, so even though they're saying a lot of these external influences may not um, equate prevention, just I just want to re remind everybody that that smoking is one of those external factors. Um, and then he said at the end that he said, "What about?" He said instead of saying the patient is acropositive and has positive rheumatoid factor uh, and arthritis in order to, why don't we do an autoimmune and say ACPA positive and fatigue? And my response, I didn't say it there, but in my head was why not all three? Like we always say auto plus arthritis. So why would it have to stop? Why can't it just be ACPA plus fatigue plus arthritis? Then you're zeroing in on biomarker, autoimmune, arthritis. Mm -hmm. Another ba -dum -ba. So, yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, so I, again, I didn't say it in the chat, but, um, you know, that, that's just my two cents. So there you go. There was our, our wrap up for that. I'm going to pull back and let these ladies talk about climate. I don't even know the name of it. All I wrote down in the notes was climate. So it's climate <laughs> and, oh and rheumatic diseases. Yeah. So okay. climate pollution and rheumatic diseases and I'm looking at my phone right now because I took pictures of the slides when he was going through it. Um, Katie, stop me at any point, okay? I'm gonna kind of go back to just at the very beginning when, um, and it, his name was Dr. Frederick um, Miller and he's got a PhD and he's also got other initials, M-A-C-R, which I'm not sure what that means. Um, but anyways, so he very was- smart. Our and he's very, he's very yeah. educated and qualified to give this. this yeah, advice. I think it's got to do something with, again, climate and pollution, because it seems like, and his passion in rheumatic diseases, because he seemed very passionate about including um, the rheumatic diseases and everything he was talking about. But one of the slides he actually um, brought up, it was the in environmental influences on the development of autoimmune and rheumatic diseases across the lifespan. And it broke it out into like little bubbles that he had. The first one was solvents and pesticides, occupational, which are like silica and metals that you can inhale, um, smoking and air pollution, sunlight and vitamin D, hormones, nutrition, infection, and microbiome. And then he talked about your susceptibility factors, which can be genetics, your sex, developmental stage. And then um, he got very specific into like your gametes, in utero, um, perinatal, early childhood. So it's again, the lifespan that's all the way to adulthood, that's where he ended. And he broke it down into three spots underneath that, which was um, immune dysregulation and autoimmunity and then inflammation. So he broke it down into those three, into those three buckets. But he talked about everything kind of came into those different areas. Um, and then he talked about possible mechanisms. And again, possible mechanisms by which the environmental exposures may induce autoimmune and rheumatic diseases. And um, again, he got in, it got into very specific things like the alteration of target tissue, 
um, the upregulation or alter, um, altered location of the target tissue expression. And it talks about just um, all different like changes in your DNA. So, you know, just even down to that level of changes, changes in your microbiome, which is in your gut, like Tiffany was saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last piece was, again, other effects or combinations of all the above. So it got very complicated. Again, there's research out there right now, but these are some of the possible effects. He talked about the greenhouse effect and how that has all been changing. Um, the photosensitivity. Gas, yes, definitely. Um, he talked very much about the CO2 concentration and how it has risen since um let's see what was the time frame i thought there was a time frame on this apparently not but again it was um it hovered around and i'm not even sure exactly what these measurements are but it hovered at 200 ppm so i'll lowercase and it hovered there and then it went up to 400 ppm which is where we're currently at and he said that's getting to the point where of no return, you know, as far as, you know, where our carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere, which is scary. Parts per million. Parts per million. Thank you. Global average atmospheric carbon dioxide. Well, this is a measurement that it, yeah. it says parts, parts per million. So okay. Right. Thank you. Because that's exactly what that is talking about. So it hovered at around 200. And it literally has spiked and it looks like a very small amount of time because it looks like the timeline was fairly long and it has spiked at and it's that's where the current level is. And they talked about the global temperature change from 1850 to 2020 right now. And back in the 1800s, it was just cycling at a very low level and it wasn't changing much, but it seemed like in the past 30 to 40 years, we are almost at a critical temperature point, um, which is 1.5 degrees Celsius. And um, it's from the Ed Hawkins study. And it's interesting just to see, I wish I could show you this right now, but it, it just showed it going like this. And then there's two levels of red on the outside. We're almost to the first red level. And that has happened significantly within the past 40 years. So did, did they compare it to our diseases and how? Not yet, but this is just talking oh, okay. about global, what's happening okay. in, our, in, our, in our countries. And again, all of the natural disasters that have been happening. Um, again, Amazon rainforest, there's um, droughts the Arctic sea ice, there's like a whole bunch of different things as far as all these different things globally are changing at a detrimental rate at this point. Um, they talked about climate change and its impact on nature. And then it talked about the climate change and its impact on humanity. That yeah. diagram just um, is scary, again, it, we're having major decreases in crop production. Um, we're increasing our undernourished people. Um, hunger has skyrocketed. Um, it's increased the humanitarian assistance. Um, we've been having, I can't read this, den dengue fever in the Asians, European and African, just from the higher admissions, it's causing something called D-E-N-G-U-E fever. And that is skyrocketing their vector-borne diseases. Um, like they mention, I think they mentioned how um, it could have related to how COVID spread so quickly, or was I, started even. Yeah, he mentioned that. It's not part of the slide, but that's what he likened it to. You're absolutely right. It's like all these things that are happening. Um, there's increased flooding in the United States out east and water scarcity uh, in the West in the United States, but in other countries, it, it's getting just detrimental. Um, and they, like the increase in heat having more impacts for many people with our diseases, 
um, That's where a very low heat tolerance. Like, where is this going? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's some, like, I'm still waiting for the other yeah. shoe to drop. And that's mm-hmm. where Katie's talking. And also the rays, the the heat, but also the um, UV, UV rays, rays and UVA, yeah, rays. All of those things that are we're getting more exposed to, and okay. our people of our with our disease kinds are reacting and we're flaring more and breathing in all these other things were flare he just kept talking about just the increased rates of flaring anything else on that katie that you wanted to say um i'm trying to think but like all these other environmental changes can create changes in our own bodies and create more flares more triggers make it harder to manage our diseases harder to get the nutrients harder to stay cool um and even, you know, with environmental disasters, harder to get our medicines, harder mm. to um, keep our medicines cool if we don't have power. Yes. Just all these kind of, it's it's like subtle in the background, but all of a sudden it can, you know, be it's very just, like, cyclical. Thing. And it just keeps like mm-hmm. this causes that. And then this causes that. And yeah. And even in different countries, all the different things that they're going through as well. Um one thing that they did talk about was the climate change and health. It talked about exposure pathways associated with climate change. And it talked about specifically heat waves, food security and nutrition, hurricanes and flooding, air pollution, infectious agents like um, Zika with mosquitoes and things like that, and mm-hmm. drought. It said that the health outcomes would be heat related illnesses and deaths, cardiopulmonary illnesses, food, water, and vector-borne diseases, impact on extreme weather events, mental health effects and stress, and then the biggest thing for us, increased frequency and severity of immune-mediated diseases, which is exactly what Mm. our diseases are, right? It was really interesting, again, just seeing um, where we're rating, I, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time looking into that in the past couple, you hear about climate change and then you always hear it's fake climate change, but then you, I mean, but this is, you can't repute what's actually happening and the raising in temperature. I have been feeling like for the last couple of years in the Midwest, um, where we tend to be, I feel like our seasons are sliding. Like, yeah. For Christmas, how often do we really have snow for Christmas oh. when mm-hmm. we used to? And now it's actually January, well, February. You, especially you, you're in Wisconsin. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust me, I've been paying attention. <laughs> or the polar vortexes, those are harsh on me. Just so yes. bitter cold, not oh, being able to like, move. Temperature. So. Oh yeah, I don't like cold. Cold does not work well with me. Heat is one thing. But humidity, that's a whole nother thing. But, you know, it, just some of these things. Just, yeah, yeah, it's hard exactly. to. That's what we're coming to, sadly. Um, and we have to prepare for, especially with our diseases. Yeah. And he did have a summary slide, and I'm just seeing what would actually just make the most. So um, more focused research in areas is needed to define the risks and mechanism for how climate change will impact autoimmune and rheumatic diseases and how to best prevent them. That was one piece that he actually talked about. He talked about health care providers needing to have an important role in increasing um, climate resistance of healthcare systems, things like that, and helping, um, helping protect and prevent patients from the adverse effects of climate change. And then his big thing, what the last thing he ended with was working together, we can impact climate change. The health benefit gained will far outweigh the costs of meeting climate goals. So it was interesting, again, just for me, just really listening to this guy and he got very in depth and in detail and um I just haven't really paid much attention to it and shame on me (laughs) I mean I do all the things I I can within my own community and things like that but just seeing how much change has happened within the last 30 to 40 years is scary Katie anything else 
to add? No, it is scary, but you know, at least we're a little bit warned. Yeah, exactly. So again, he gave us some different things and just, you know, getting more research out there that are based on exactly what he mentioned. I think that would be great. So yeah, so that was to sum that session up, which was really interesting. Apparently there was this morning, there was a study group that he was referencing. And I don't think any of us got to that particular session for the study group, but oh, okay. um, yeah. But it was interesting to see it because I hadn't seen anything on climate change at any of our conferences so far. There was one at Euler earlier this year. And I probably didn't go to it or hadn't seen it. So I did, and it was pretty much the same kind of information. So it is, okay. you know, the research is starting to develop and gain momentum. So, Well, that's good to see and actually see that it's actually being disseminated at these type of conferences for all of us. All right. Good. Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to jump into the last part, really. Um, we're going to mention a couple of things about COVID after that, but we'll jump into, um, I went to watch a session which is a topic really close to our hearts at our organization and it was on undifferentiated connective tissue disease and uh, I want to preface this by saying the term undifferentiated connective tissue disease in itself has sort of evolved depending on where you are in the world or or different doctors um, have have said that it's, I think it's being in the latest coding, it may have even fallen off. Like it, so I, I just wanna, wanna mention that the term is an umbrella term, but I don't think it's quite as umbrella as at one point it was. If on our website under aiarthritis.org backslash diseases, we started journaling the different, we just call it undifferentiated disease because people will say, well, I was, I have undifferentiated connective tissue disease, or then there's undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, arthropathy, unclassified seronegative spondyloarthritis, undifferentiated inflammatory polyarthritis, undifferentiated autoimmune um, inflammatory disease. Like, we have so many of these that we've collected and the, 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 the unifying factor there is you have an early presentation of something that falls in this category and it has not quite evolved or developed to a point, um, whether that's symptom wise or um, blood, you know, blood level wise, lab, laboratory wise, that meets a criteria to diagnose you as whatever that is. So different doctors will call it different things. The other thing that I want to mention, and this wasn't part of the session, this is just general knowledge and, and what we do as an organization, um, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, in, in, if we just think of the umbrella term anyway, but we'll, we'll use that uh, right now, is that not all patients even know if they were actually diagnosed with that first. I only know I was because even back then, I was kind of like aggressive, I guess, <laughs> on wanting to answer my records, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I was, because they kept saying, well, we need to wait, wait and watch for you to get worse. You have to watch, well, I'm going to watch you get worse. I'm going to watch you get worse. And they wouldn't give me any treatments. And they, and I did, I kept getting worse. And I, you know, I was like, is there something I can call this? Because I was getting so frustrated. My parents are asking, people are asking what's wrong with you. I mean, it was clearly out clear I was going downhill fast. And, and she said, undifferentiated connective tissue disease. So that's all I had to go for. But she would have never told me that. Unless you asked. Uh, unless I pressed it. And, and I wanted to make that really clear because we did a study in, in 2013 to 14. It was the first research study we ever did at our organization. And um, we wanted to test the hypothesis that what was perceived at 15% of people originally diagnosed with undifferentiated connective tissue disease actually moved forward to a full-blown diagnosis. That's what research was saying, 15%. And talking to other patients, we were like, it's gotta be higher. 
that just doesn't make sense. How can it only be 15%? There's so many of us that don't have answers that, that wait and don't even know that that's what they have. Whether the doctor officially diagnosed it or just never Didn't tell them. told them, like there was all these questions. So it was a secondary um, thing that we were testing in this, in this research, these early symptom study of six diseases. But we were curious when we asked in the questionnaire the earliest symptoms they could remember, it was, it was a retrospective study, which means you're going back and, you know, there is a bias of memory and et cetera. But in that first six to 12 months, what people were reporting and what was so amazing is it sort of proved our theory because it said what was showing is literally 15%, I think it was like 14.9 people who were diagnosed and knew they were diagnosed went on to develop these diseases. But then when you look at what people reported on their symptoms, and then you've got this lag of diagnosis and they marked that they were never, they were just told they didn't know what was wrong with them. It was 54%. I remember that. And yeah. yeah. And so that was a huge aha moment. So this has become a very big focus for our organization, this early diagnosis, early detection. What is it called? Do you even know that you have <laughs> official diagnosis? And is it undifferentiated connective tissue disease or does it fall under one of these other sort of undifferentiated early pre-diagnosis diagnosis? Okay, in saying that, let me tell you what I learned. <laughs> so um, I knew a lot of this. Uh, actually, just because of the work we do at our organization. But how I'm going to summarize it for you is essentially they, the, the people who were presenting were doing, uh, they started doing a literature review. And what that means is when you're doing research, you're starting a research project, that early phases is to go back and look through journals to you go and you find everything that's been done in, in this arena. And then you, it becomes like an index of publications so that you can, you can see what's been done, how can I build on it, and, and essentially has my theory been proven, that, that type of thing. So the title of this session was um, met, well, I didn't want to go to the, uh, um, the second one, I'll make a comment on, but that it was basically diagnosis uh, and treatment. So they were looking on specifically for diagnostic criteria and symptom complexity. That's the, the one that I, I focused on. So there's no real definition. Even and, now. Even, even now. now. And, it, and it's just, how can you have a diagnosis of something that has no definition, first of all, and, um, and there's different de definitions. So you pull, you pull, they're basically pulling up a lot of citations, a lot of this is called, it's called here, or these are the symptoms that are listed in this, you know, in this criteria. And then there, it's just amazing that even today, and one of the things we were so fascinated with as an organization, there was this group, uh, it just always says Mosca et al. So it, the, the last name of whomever the lead researcher is Mosca. I've got to find this person because I've been quoting them <laughs> over the decade. And here we go. They start showing that research again for Mosca. And I was like, Mosca. I know that. Mosca. Yeah. I know that name. And so they were showing all of this research that they had published on wanting to do classification criteria. What it, just like you would for RA, right? You have a classification criteria and it's updated every few years. And if you meet them, then that's what you have. And they're, they can't even, people, I want to say they, globally, there's no mutual agreement on what that classification is, okay? So if we're trying to focus on early detection and early diagnosis, at least we have to figure out, in my opinion, what the pre- clinical is we're, we're really jumping into prevention and all this other stuff so for, you for know und I, undifferentiated which again they have a no classification but they're trying to jump into treatment and whatnot for it so so yes yeah, so formal diagnostic classification criteria does not exist and even patients are unclear of what it means by the right name and so they they did reference um the european reference network in 2019 was also looking to find out more about 
the, the classifications and diagnostic. And um, a lot of the things in this literature review, I kept highlighting 2009, 1999. Two, I mean, uh, I'm looking at these slides and I'm saying, man, old. 1998. Yeah. Nine two thousand eight is that yeah, and and I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself, okay, if that is what if if, if the data we're we're looking at, how many times has the diagnostic criteria changed for RA? So you're saying in two thousand eight that only twelve percent or twenty percent or fifteen percent or whatever patients that had undifferentiated diagnosis or connective tissue disease progressed to to lupus or RA or what have you, that's gotta be higher because the criteria for diagnosis is now easier, right? You can you can go where it was very hard to diagnose it for RA and then when it changed in 2010 and then again later, it became easier. So that's what my brain was like exploding inside my head because that's all I kept thinking was this makes no, the numbers make no sense. Um, but then they happily surprised me because then they st then they started um, talking about again Mos Mosca came up which kind of made me laugh so they had a two that they were taking a 2014 criteria for rheumatoid arthritis um, systemic sclerosis which also used to be called scleroderma um, but the the newer term is is systemic sclerosis and uh, lupus RA I don't know which one I I already said first but they took the more recent criteria and then across the board you looked at the the older data they, that they had generated and then they realized if you would have taken those symptoms from those people sort of like what we did in our yeah. study then it was like 16 percent were additionally reclassified 20 percent were originally so it was like the note that percentage was now going up because it was no longer 15 it was 35 or it was 40 or it was whatever because all of those people that initially you're talking undifferentiated. Why is this important? Well, historically, expect, and this happened to me when I was undifferentiated, they said, I can't treat you. You don't, there is no treatment plan for undifferentiated. We have to wait and watch to get, wait for you to get worse. So you get a diagnosis and we can treat you. So I fell in that loophole. Sort of the loophole we were talking about in the in the earlier um, debrief segment on um, the the early RA or the prevention of RA. It's like where does that wall come into play with our access to care and, and where we're we're able to treat? Um, but they used the example that a question saying, "Okay, great, I have this. Is there anything to stop the the progression?" And um, and there. It, it's it's really up to this challenging moment even today where we don't know what we can give you so that's and, kind and of it's just this this couldn't have come in my in my opinion again at a better time to bring reintroduce this issue because if we're trying to do prevention studies we're trying to treat earlier we're talking about precision medicine you gotta figure out what the heck undifferentiated connective tissue or any of the precursor leading up to a diagnosis you've got to figure that out we have got to come together as a as a community or who, the researchers whoever needs right. to just agree and we, we have to get something there where, where we where we can build on um because so, again it takes all of the early diagnosis to better treatment to cause less destruction. And that's not happening because they're waiting yeah. for um, all of the next steps. Now, Tiffany, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't um, didn't um, AI arthritis also bring something to the forward data bank that there- we, we have, yes, you were at that meeting. You knew, yes. you're like, correct yes. me if I'm wrong. You were sitting at the table. You right, I'm just this. making sure. <laughs> it's nice to for yeah, that. I was trying um, to tee up a little bit. Yeah, that was that was clever. Sorry <laughs> that I called you out on that, but um, <laughs> I was sitting at the table. So, but. so yes, forward 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 data bank, formerly known as Forward National Data Bank for Rheumatic Diseases. Um, we they have built and are housing our own AI arthritis data bank within their system, within their servers, and that came about based on 
a project that we had had done a community team and an award winning project um, that really catapulted us into this whole precision medicine genre back in 2015. And um, we developed, we created an online project platform and that we could house all of our projects. We could do focus groups. We could do a lot of breakout um, situations and we needed a database. We needed somewhere to house the research, the information that we were doing. And we went to a meeting with them but initially, they were just going to help us with that one project. But then we started talking about all of the possibilities, and in particular, undifferentiated disease. So in their we mouths, saying, their jaw we, drop. <laughs> I said to them, "Okay, here's the situation. We're we're getting all of these patients to sign up for this broader AR Arthritis Voices program, which we'll happy be happy to um, link to on this." This YouTube, essentially, it's not just patients, it's any of you, any stakeholder that's watching this sign up, we will connect you with opportunities to be at the table to solve problems with us. Um, and one of those problems was I said, hey, we're getting all these people to sign up for this AR Arthritis Voices program and the, pro the projects that will go into this online platform. Doesn't it make sense to also capture the people who are not yet diagnosed that have this undifferentiated because if we do, we would be the first ones in history, to my knowledge, to actually capture them in diagnose and in, in their actual diagnosis. And you told the and, story. And they were like, yeah. And you told the story of the 15%, but then what we captured, what right. which was what you did. And, and they they yeah, they were blown so, away and like holy smokes. So that is something that as we build out this this program and we start having people sign up, it's not just people who are already diagnosed, it's people who right. think that they may have our diseases that we're also looking to capture because of this reason. And maybe the data we collect could help these researchers to help um, clinicians to help us all come together and in some some way right. keep this down. <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. we have a strong baseline um, to build on in a realist, realistic numbers. Um, it was, oh, I, I skipped this part. Well, they were they they did a really good job of, of taking a, a like this is a patient, they're here, this is what we're telling them. We diagnosed them with then they have the next question, the treatment. So I liked how they they created a story. What I didn't like was the original story, and I I could I couldn't post anything in the chat because we have you know we're being professional and it's not my place but in my head I, another like aneurysm I'm having um, they gave this the the scenario when she this patient first had symptoms and went to a doctor who recommended she go to a rheumatologist because she had a, an elevated ANA level and Raynaud's and some hair loss and some joint pain and, and a couple other things. And the rheumatologist ran the, um, ran the labs and said, well, there, I can't see any swelling or anything in like a physical examination. And the ANA is not high enough tighter to be, to be lupus. So clear, it said, it said, it said like, so clearly your high level of anxiety is causing this and maybe you should seek therapy. <laughs> what? <laughs> then I, I can't say, days. they did not tell us what year this was. I mean, this could have been, you know, who knows? I hope it was 10 years ago. I was, gonna say, this. Yeah. I was thinking 1990. <laughs> but we do unfortunately still hear patients say this today that, right. that they are told that. So if you are a rheumatologist and you are listening, do not ever say that <laughs> to a patient. So it, to there's come back nothing and have worse. Labs. Yeah, when they're, when they're symptomatic, go back and have labs right then, you know, because and, and you know what, maybe if there was such a thing where they could classify undifferentiated or whatever we, right. we want to call it, maybe, you know, then it, it could, they didn't say, but it, it seemed like in the, in the session with they, where they, that the patient did end up getting diagnosed with undifferentiated connective tissue, but it clearly wasn't from the rheumatologist, which led me to believe, even though they did not clarify that it was the, the primary care physician that did the diagnosis, which is wrong. Right. In, in, in itself. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, I forgot, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that. Yeah. So anyway, that was a, that was very intriguing. There was a second part. I, it was about the, the, so the psychosocial challenges, but I have to admit it was not novel to me in the sense that everything that they were capturing was the same thing we all go through. Who am I now? I'm too young. What's this going to do to my social life? So I, I, I looked at it and just went, well, that's not novel to undifferentiated. That's, right. We all go, go through that. Right. So, so, you know, kudos. I just didn't, um, I, it, the only thing I can say is it's the same. It was pretty, it was pretty much um, the same yeah. thing. One thing I will, I will add to this. They did just talk about some research too, that was done with undifferentiated disease. And I'm going to go back and see if there was anything else to pull. But, well, actually two points. This I found fascinating. Um, when they were talking about the patients and questions they would ask, they talked about, is, uh, first of all, is there anything to help stop the progression? I know I've got this now. If undifferentiated stays at undifferentiated, then it typically will, will never get to that super aggressive disease, which is a good thing. So side note, if you have undifferentiated connective tissue disease, it could be a blessing. You know, I know it's frustrating to say, I don't know what I have, but if people would recognize that as a, <laughs> right. as a diagnosis, then you do have something. And it's a good thing because the, the, the possibility that you could get into to a worse situation is lower. So that, that's good. Um, in saying that, uh, they did say that um, they talked a little bit about those sort of pre-treatments again. As we talked about already that there's some that's happening in um, trying to treat incomplete lupus um, by revisiting hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. and treating tr pre-treating early. So it's that same pre-treatment. Some of the earlier studies did show when they tried these before, same thing happened. The patients did end up getting the diseases, but it just didn't have, it just was prolonged because they were on the treatment. So just knowing that that's out there. And then right. this fact study the the theoretic patient again i don't know if it was a real person or not was wanting to start a family with and and was worried about first of all progression and second of all treatment and they presented a study that showed pregnant women that are diagnosed with undifferentiated connective tissue disease were more likely 20% 20 20.4% to 4.5% of healthy subjects were more likely to progress to definite disease than non than non pregnant. Oh wow! So there was something. Oh, I'm sorry, not healthy, non pregnant. You so people who were not pregnant and had use um, undifferentiated connective tissue disease and had um, had 4.6% chance of progressing, but the pregnant women had 20%, 20.4 percent chance of progressing to full-on disease. How many stories have we heard of, of women who have said, I had my first flare after I gave birth? How many? Or I can't even tell you. It's yeah. so, I have heard that I had onset after childbirth. And I yeah. always thought of it as the severe physical trauma, because we do know that's an environmental right. trigger. But now I'm kind of like, they have had early undifferentiated. They had maybe had some arthritis. Maybe they had some fatigue. Maybe they had some of these other symptoms that went, go get the therapist. Yeah. When in reality, they could have been doing a something about the it. Mixture, the hormones, the, right. the, the, the physical. So that just leaves us with a, with a food for thought, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was good. I was really glad I went to that one. Good. I really enjoyed that one. Um, so that's it. Um, there were a couple COVID. Um, there was just, a, I think, a couple bullets we wanted to, to throw on that um, at the end. Um, I, it seemed like they were reiterating everything that we've covered before. Um, I know I viewed a session that was mostly for physicians just kind of talking about it. So nothing really recommended or to report out, but I just 
it was nice to see that in a conference setting, they still had, you know, a place for these doctors to come together and still have those kind of slightly informal conversations about, you know, Thanks, what are you doing in your practice? What are you doing? Yeah. Or, okay, why are you doing that? And, you know, look out for this or that. And I'm working on this study and that study. So it was really kind of, um, I don't know, nice. And again, kind of hopeful to see them all working together and trying to, you know, figure things out for, for the good of their patients. So that's right. really Do you have anything that you saw today? Again, nothing that's, um, again, it, it's kind of all becoming reoccurring type of things and yeah. the same themes. It's kind of what we already know. And um, they're just calling it a different title. And again, probably some of this brainstorming stuff. Because again, it it's what, two years old? Are we even two years old with COVID? I mean, right. so yeah, so it's it's such a learning curve. And again, it's Super like weird here in my face. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know when you feel it, it's kind of like it's all you I can, can feel. It. Uh, yeah. I don't know where it's at, but it's itching my face. So sorry. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, a hundred percent. But yeah, um, I think again, we're learning so much more than it's too soon to know, which was last year entirely. Um, last year just seemed to be it's too soon to know. It's too soon to know. But now there there's still it's early research but again it's good that it's, it's happening a start yeah and you have it's a cat there's, there's there's something attacking the <laughs> side note apparently um pets of the acr is big, a big thing this year so I'm over the balcony there somewhere. no you're absolutely um, right katie everybody is posting their cats pets of ACR. dogs yeah it is a nice piece just to see all the animals um, but no, I, I did not attend any of them today. I did go into the one that you all are talking about literally for a couple minutes. I popped in and, um, the, and I did immediately see a comment that I just wanted to, to mention. There was somebody who was, I don't know what, what country, um, they, but they, they had said, been talking about third doses, the boosters, and then maybe even fourth doses, which led to this commenter, which I'll let you finish. Okay. So, so. I, I see this comment and it said, can something to the sort of, can anyone weigh in on um, the ethics of the United States talking about a potential fourth dose when some places haven't even received one? And, you know, we do, I wanted to bring that up just because we as a, an international organization, we are very aware of this. We have yeah. talked about it in some of our other of our other debriefs, we do talk about it in, in the work that we do as our organization. We are aware, um, we, you know, we, there's nothing as an organization <laughs> that we can do about that. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a government thing, it is a country you know, thing, it is distribution. I can't answer that, we can't answer that. Um, all we can do is just tell you if you have an opportunity to get a vaccination, it is recommended. <laughs> Sorry. I know your cat. <laughs> He's sitting on a bunch of people right here in the bottom. Yeah, the bottom half. Um, you can, you know, if you have the opportunity, it is recommended by for all rheumatology patients to to be vaccinated if it is safe for you. If you are not a person who have had um, for, uh, bad reactions to vaccinations or whatever, you and your doctor decide together. But for the majority. It is um, highly <laughs> ghosting. It's like a floating cat ghost yeah, yeah. over here. Um, so anyway, we did just want to acknowledge that you know we we do hear you. We do hear people from from other countries, and and um, we respect the, the position that that you're in. And we certainly hope that access for everybody who wants it will happen sooner than later. So. Absolutely. Okay. I think yep. that's it. I know we wanted to give a shout out also, um, again, to Effie and to uh, Stephanie. And a thank you, Katie, for putting in our, our notes here. I'm looking at you can, we always tell them they, they can tell you where to find them. So um, you can find uh, Effie is rising above RA and Stephanie is the young face of arthritis, I believe. Yes. And then I think in one of the, in, I think on Twitter, she has to put RA because of- It limit word count or yeah, character yeah, yeah, count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you could just Google either one of those and, and, and find them on various platforms. And then for us, 
you can find us at our social media platforms at IF, which stands for the International Foundation, and then AI Arthritis. So um, you can find us at all of the, the social media platforms. If you want to continue this conversation, you can comment in the YouTube comments. If you want it to be private, you can email us info at AIarthritis.org, or you can message us at our social media. There's always ways that you can get a hold of us, and we are here to listen. We are here to communicate. The reason we're doing this is to give you the information. We want to hear your perspectives and opinions uh, so that we can continue talking and solving problems and figuring out you know, how, how we can move forward to fill in some of these gaps and, and make the world a better place for all of us living with the diseases. So anything else you all want to add to that? I think that's yeah. a perfect way to end. I think Let's yeah. make the world better. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another. What do you do? <laughs> All right, well, it is, it is 8.30 p.m. for Deb and myself. It is 9.30 p.m. for Miss Katie, 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 Katie Katz. I forgot what your name is in the Kate, Katie's Cats or something. In our, oh, yeah. In our, in Devilicious <laughs> and Tricky Tea. You have, to, you have to get to know us better, know what all that means, but that's yeah. okay. We'll um, that anyway, we're coming. signing out from day three of the ACR, moving into the final full day of the conference, although we will continue to watch some of the sessions and report back to you. Um, There's oh, still lots moment. to learn. Oh There's my still goodness. Lots, yeah. Still lots to see. So tuning out ACR uh, 21. It's like, I feel like lo love connection. I'm really dating myself now. <laughs> back in two and two. All right. See you all tomorrow and uh, we're going to get some rest. All right. I'm going to get some dinner. <laughs> and, uh, some food. Dinner. <laughs> all right dinner sleep until tomorrow all right